Welcome to Future Histories. My name is Jan Groß and it is my great pleasure to welcome Thomas Swan in today's episode. He is the author of Anarchist Cybernetics, Control and Communication in Radical Politics, a book I enjoyed reading immensely since it merges two fields of interest that are frequently featured in this podcast, Anarchism and Cybernetics. And a quick shout out, since they have an episode talking about the book Anarchist Cybernetics, and since I enjoy their podcast in general quite a lot, I wanted to point you all towards the Cybernetic Marxist podcast General Intellect Unit. You'll find the link in the show notes together with a bunch of other interesting material about and around Thomas's work. And now, please enjoy today's episode with Thomas Swan on anarchist cybernetics. Welcome, Thomas. Thanks very much, yeah, and thanks for having me. And um, yeah, I'm really, really glad you enjoyed the book and really, really looking forward to talking about it. Thank you. Great. I'm very much looking forward to it as well. Even though, as I said, both uh, anarchism and cybernetics have been featured in Future Histories in other episodes already, I think it would be still good to start with a kind of uh, overview. Could you give us a brief idea of your understanding of cybernetics as well as anarchism? Yeah, of course, yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm going to start with anarchism because I think that's um, that was sort of my starting point going into cybernetics. Um, so... I think there's sort of two elements of anarchism which are which are important to to highlight. Um, the first of these is what we can kind of consider the um, critique that anarchism gives us. Um, so anarchism, you know, gives us a certain you know set of tools for helping us understand um, why society looks the way it does, why politics operates the way it does, why why the the um, economy functions in the ways that it does. So right from the very early days of anarchism, so back to the sort of middle of the 19th century with people like um, Pierre-Joseph Proudhon, um, we really see this, this critique coming through really strong. So it really is a way of looking at um, how capitalism was developing, how colonialism was developing, um, and being able to provide tools to say, okay, we, we can understand what's happening here. We can understand why hierarchies emerge in societies. Um, we can understand the, the links between um, the kind of hierarchical domination that we see in the state, where we have you know sort of centralized top-down government that you know dictates laws and controls the police, has a monopoly on on violence. Um, how that is very very closely connected and perhaps even inseparable from um, how economic exploitation operates through through capitalism. So how um, you know the, the the means of production are owned by you know wealthy capitalists, and that means that everyone else, you know, the working class, are selling labor and are exploited in that. Um, so 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 that capitalists can you know make 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 profit off of the labor that other other people are doing. So anarchism gives us a way of linking those and seeing that the, the emergence of capitalism and the emergence of, of the state, of or the, 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 the modern state, were very much the same, the same process. And, and, and they're, they're different things with different operating logics, but they reinforce one another and they've, they've emerged historically together um, because they, they are mutually beneficial and reinforce one another. Um, and I think recently we've seen that sort of critique element of anarchism um, expanded um, by thinking in, in much more detail about um, how things like patriarchy and white supremacy and colonialism are also tied up in this picture. So you have that in the sort of history of anarchism with people like you know, Lucy Parsons and Emma Goldman bringing a kind of feminist and sometimes anti-racist critique into that, that sort of critical element of anarchism. But over the last couple of decades, probably we've seen that come through much, much stronger, um, particularly as anarchism has started to draw on um, sort of black radical politics, black feminism, intersectionality. So we've seen a lot of that sort of um, critique coming through of how anarchism can help us explain why, why the world looks the way it does. 
Um, but the second element of anarchism, which I think is really important um, as well, and perhaps even more important, is finding ways to dismantle or destroy that that those particular systems. Um, so you know, the state, capitalism, patriarchy, white supremacy. Anarchism also gives us tools to understand them, but also to how can we dismantle or destroy them and create alternatives. So how can we think about how we govern our communities, how we you know, create agreements between each other, how we you know, guarantee security, guarantee you know, safety, um, you know, security in terms of you know, physical safety, but also you know, food security, material security, things like that. Um, so anarchism gives us the tools to also build something different, build a kind of alternative to the systems that, 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 that we currently face. And importantly, build you know, alternatives that don't have domination, don't have you know, hierarchical control, don't have economic exploitation, don't have you know, racist or patriarchal domination built into them. So how can we create alternative systems? And there's a very close link between the critique and those alternatives, because what anarchists were doing, so from, from the very, very early days, one of the things that distinguishes anarchism is the kind of um, utopian elements of imagining, well, what kind of future society can we create? Um, that wasn't something that the anarchists were, you know, just you know, sitting around and trying to think up, hey, what, what would the best society look like? They were actually taking inspiration from how indigenous societies were, were organised, how you know, peasant communities were organised before capitalism. So they were really saying, okay, there, there are these seeds for how society can be organised in more democratic, more horizontal ways. Um, we're not inventing this new. This is something that e exists in the past and exists still in, in everyday life in a lot of ways. So it's really how we can sort of expand that so that that is the main logic of how we, how, how we organise ourselves. Um, so that kind of covers anarchism, I think, and there's probably I mean, there's a, a lot more to, to say about it, but that's, I think, the sort of um, bedrock of it. So it is a philosophy aimed at how can we you know, critique things like domination and exploitation, but also how can we create alternatives? How can we create non-dominating ways of living together? How can we create non-exploitative ways of living together? And I think, so for me, there's a close link between that and cybernetics, um, because at least the way I understand cybernetics and the way I discovered it um, was through a focus on self-organization. So cybernetics you know, emerged kind of in the you know, post-World War II um, sort of technological and scientific milieu, um, particularly looking at electronic systems and, you know, very early computer systems and mechanical systems for how those systems can be you know, autonomous and self-organized and don't require you know constant human human control um but it quite quickly sort of developed into thinking about well can we apply some of that to social systems so can we think about um how social systems can be self-organized and i think the way cybernet well what's really useful about cybernetics in thinking this through is that what it tries to do is identify the functions um, for effective self-organization. So what are the different kind of functions that any system, uh, you know, electronic, social, mechanical, um, biological as well, um, what are the sort of functions that any of these systems need to have in order to be able to organize themselves without external control? Um, and that's that's a really important thing for me with cybernetics. And there's the the, the way cyberneticians um, have sort of gone into this and expanded on this. Um, there's a lot more detail there around the, the role of feedback, the role of information flows and communication. Um, but I think at its foundations, it really is a way of saying we can pick out the different essential functions of a self-organizing system. Um, and then with social systems, that's in a question of, okay, how do we, if those functions don't exist already, how do we create them? If they already exist, how do we strengthen them? How do we make social systems better at 
self-organizing. Hearing these definitions of uh, anarchism and uh, cybernetics already gives us an idea of this, but maybe you could elaborate a bit further. What potential did you see in bringing those two together, anarchism and uh, cybernetics? What made you uh, work towards anarchist cybernetics, actually? And maybe what was the problem you wanted to see addressed? Yeah, so I think my sort of um, what, what got me interested in cybernetics, and I think that Well, yeah, I think I think starting from there might might help answer that question. So, what got me interested was um, so this was you know more, more than a decade ago now um, when there was the the kind of um, 2011 uprisings. So we had the you know Arab Spring and the Indignados in Spain, and then the Occupy movement. Um, but there was also the riots in London um, in that year as well, which aren't often brought into this picture of the 2011 uprisings um, because a lot of people look at them and say, well, they weren't, they weren't explicitly political. They didn't make demands. It was just, it was more this kind of, um, you know, eruption of, 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 of chaos. But I think that sort of doesn't really do a service to, to how that kind of riot um, is, is very political, how it's born of, you know, a, a particular political situation. And it is, a reaction to um, the kind of political forces that people are experiencing in their lives. But what really interested me about those, about the London riots was, you know, you had this experience over, you know, three, three or four days when, you know, essentially a lots of, lots of groups of teenagers were able to sort of outperform or out-organize um, one of the most you know, well-resourced, well-adapted, largest police forces in the world. Um, and the way they did that, which, which is what sort of drew my attention, was because of, a, you know, the sort of confluence of a certain number of factors. Um, they could, kind of by accident, they actually had in their hands these you know, incredibly powerful communication tools. So, um Blackberry phones at the time were very, very cheap. They were trying to sort of, you know, this is when Blackberry was first trying to expand the use of smartphones. So they made these phones incredibly cheap. So loads of these teenagers had, had Blackberry smartphones um, and Blackberry had its own messaging system, which was incredibly, um, it had incredibly strong encryption. So, you know, people could send messages. There was no way for the police to see those messages. There was no way for... Blackberry to actually get into that system and see those messages because it was a system that Blackberry was trying to develop and market at um, you know big corporations and governments and things like that. So they wanted it to be incredibly secure. Um, but what that meant was that you had you know the, these these you know young people in London um, and other parts of the UK as well were able to to network in real time incredibly effectively. So they were able to share information. They were able to um, you know, communicate safe routes through the city. They were able to communicate the position of police around the city. Um, and that allowed them to, to evade the police and, and escape arrest for, for, for quite quite some days. Um, it didn't, didn't last that long, but, but it was still quite incredible that it managed for as long as it did. And that kind of, you know, tied in with a lot of sort of narratives around the time around, you know, um, network politics and how these new technologies, you know, the was a sort of second wave of internet technologies where they were becoming, um, you know, A, much more common and more accessible, but also much more mobile. So people had internet technologies in, in their pockets suddenly for the first time. Um, and so there was a lot of talk around, the, around you know, 2011 and the years around that about this new kind of networked form of politics. And um, yes, it was more you know the in information was shared very fast and it allowed people to respond and adapt to situations very very quickly without needing to have a centralized control structure that was you know taking information in and then giving orders out um but then also we saw with things like occupy and the arab spring and indignados that also brought a democratic element in because partly because of these technologies but also just because of um, the kind of politics that that people were were working with at the time, you know, these these movements were much more radically democratic than a lot of uprisings and revolutions that we've seen in the past. 
Um, so you know, that period is typically referred to as the movement of the squares, because one of the things that was typified by was people occupying, you know, public squares in in, in different parts of big big cities, um, and typically across the world, people were holding assemblies. Um, they were making decisions democratically. Um, you know, there, there weren't really leaders in, in, in a traditional sense. Um, and people, everyone, at least in theory, everyone could participate in how these social movements were, were governed. So they were, they were very self-organised in a very um, anarchistic sense, even if they weren't all explicitly anarchist or drawing on, on um, an, an anarchist politics. But I think that sort of, for me, sort of drew me into cybernetics. Um, and it was through you know, reading the work of Colin Ward, who's a you know, very, very influential um, British anarchist in the sort of post, post-war years, so I think, yeah, sort of 60s through, through to the 80s or 90s. Um, so Colin Ward's one of the most influential figures in British anarchism in this period. Um, and he writes a lot about self-organization and, and he sort of drops the word cybernetics a couple of times and things that he wrote, but doesn't really expand on it in much detail. But I think I think just reading that and the word cybernetics, I was suddenly like, oh that that sounds interesting. That's that's quite quite a sexy term that I've not I've not heard heard mentioned before. Um and that sort of drew me in and realized, well, there there, there were a, a handful of engagements with cybernetics. By anarchists, kind of from the very early 1960s um, onwards, probably through to the 1980s. Um, and it was around linking how cybernetics sees self-organization. So as I, as I mentioned, you know, in this sort of way of identifying what are the sort of functions for effective self-organization, but also just that very basic point about um, systems are at their most effective. And you know, dealing with change, dealing with you know complex environments, when they have a high level of um, flexibility and a high level of autonomy built into the systems, and you know, self-organization allows for that because you don't need to have you know a central sort of organizing core in a system, um, because if you're you know, dealing in a complex environment, the sort of information flow into that central organizing core, and then the um, you know, decision making and the orders that then come out of it, that's that's a very slow process, or it can be a very slow process. Um, and you know, a lot of the work of some of the cyberneticians that I've sort of focused on, we can you know talk more about them in detail if, if, if you'd like. Um, but they kind of identify, well, okay, if if a system is in a complex environment that's, that's changing very fast and it's trying to you know filter information through some central central kind of um, central control hub, Um, you know, by the time that information is taken in, processed, and orders are fed back out, the situation will have changed again. And so those orders won't be actually relevant. So the way systems cope with that is by being self-organized so that different parts have a high level of autonomy to actually respond to change as they see fit. So they have some level of autonomy whereby they can say, okay, it's a complex environment, it's suddenly changing, and we we don't have to wait for orders. We don't have to send information up the chain and wait for a decision to be made and come back down to us. We can just make a decision and operate in this complex environment ourselves. Um, And I think that kind of autonomy is also one of the strong links with with anarchism. Um, And it's something we saw in the... You know these these 2011 movements. You know the, the London riots. These different groups of teenagers, which were running around, were autonomous. Right, there wasn't a central control structure. They were autonomously, because of the information that was being shared in these communication networks, they were able to move around the city autonomously, avoid the police. You know, get get to safe places, have escape routes. Um, so they were able to co- coordinate themselves in a, in a very decentralized and um, autonomous way. Um, so I think that's that's the exploring that in more detail as a sort of potential for a sort of anarchist engagement with cybernetics. Very interesting because I thought that your your first interest, but this was just me reading your book. I thought your first interest or the gateway through which you came to uh, cybernetics would have been exactly what you talked about in the last sentences, because I mean one of the 
more popular readings of these uh, movement of the squares is that while these were experiences that are super important still, they uh, are argued to have been very ineffective and that they kind of failed uh, in, in, in some way. And that was me thinking when reading your book that your engagement with cybernetics was also you thinking that cybernetics would be of help exactly on this question, on this problem of how to effectively organize these approaches that you're actually in favor of um, uh, through applying a cybernetic lens, so to speak. I would guess this, this was uh, somewhat uh, one of the things that drove you to cybernetics as well. Yeah, it, yeah, it was. Yeah, so I think I think that question of how how successful these these movements were is really really important. Um, I think we can look at it in well, we can look at it in, in a number of ways. And I think one of them is to think um, how you know effective were they, or how successful were they at um, you know bringing about some kind of large scale political or economic change. And we can look across the world and see well. Yeah, there's sort of very, very mixed mixed results there. So obviously, in the very immediate term, um, you know, some of the movements in North Africa and the Middle East, you know, were able to overthrow governments. Whether whether the situations they've got now are in line with the aspirations of those movements, that that's obviously incredibly debatable. Um, and we also see obviously some of these, you know, places like Libya and Syria. You know, the outcomes has been you know civil war and you know, huge, huge amount of violence and destru destruction and people having to flee their homes in in massive numbers. So it's obviously like, yeah, the, whether there was a sort of immediate you know political change that was in line with the demands or the desires of those movements, that's that's incredibly debatable. I think in you know, if we look at somewhere like you know in well in the UK or the United States as well, we can see well part of a sort of outcome of these movements was a kind of was a kind of delayed response in a sense um but then you know, kind of from 2015 up until 2020 you know we had this sort of new left-wing populist surge and you know in the UK around Jeremy Corbyn and in the US around Bernie Sanders and, and so some other um, similar politicians so we can see that's kind of, I mean, and, and there is there is stuff in those sort of populist surges around, you know, more more direct democracy, more decentralized, um, you know, democratic systems, um, certainly certainly economic systems that are much much fairer and involve more more um, opportunity for participation, um, but yeah, definitely the, these movements didn't achieve what they set out to achieve in very concrete terms. Um, but one of the other things that they were trying to do, which I think they did succeed in, um, was trying to imagine and experiment with new ways of organizing um, societies. So, I mean, Occupy is the example that I've, that I've looked into um, the most, but we see similar things in the different um, movements of the squares around, around the world. Um, you know, Occupy was able to create a kind of microcosm of, uh, you know, radically democratic, radically participatory um, society. Um, and it was something important, important. This is, again, where I think, you know, I, this sort of anarchist politics isn't coming from the position of saying, we've come up with this, you know, perfect utopian blueprint. Now let's put it into practice. It was very much an experiment. It was very much saying, "Well, let's let's try try these different ways of doing democracy. Um, let's try them out, um, and and let let's adapt them as we go on." So something we see with Occupy is, you know, it started with the General Assembly, which, you know, was, you know, these were you know large you know meetings run for the most part by um, consensus decision making so everyone had to be in agreement for a certain proposal to actually be passed and these were meetings involving in the case of Occupy Wall Street thousands of people were taking part in these meetings sometimes multiple times a day um, and they, these were incredibly effective you know incredibly complex and you know detailed decisions were being made in these assemblies um, people were dealing with complex legal things, complex financial um, matters, and, and they were able to do this fairly effectively. Um, but 
as time went on with Occupy Wall Street in, in, in particular, they start to see, well, this, this you know, large General Assembly perhaps isn't the most effective way of doing a lot of the day-to-day coordination and administration of um, you know, a large encampment of people. So they created you know, sort of small, a smaller spokes council where it would be um, you know, delegates from different working groups and different parts of the camp would be involved in making these more kind of strategic decisions. The General Assembly still happened, but they were more for you know, more sort of broader political discussions and decisions. But then the spokes council was a way of making the strategic decision making um, much more effective and much more coordinated. Um, so I think it's important to see these movements. Part of the success of them is that they were trying and testing and adapting and experimenting with, um, you know, really really radical ways of thinking about how we can organise society in very democratic, very participatory ways. And I think that's part of the legacy we have to sort of hold on to and see, okay, how how is that sort of legacy of rather than just talking about maybe these you know, new forms of democracy would work. Well, you know, people have tried them in, in large, large groups under very, very difficult circumstances, have tried them and adapted them and come out with, you know, sort of solutions to a lot of the problems that emerged. Um, and I think another thing about the sort of failure of these movements, um, the kind of odds they were up against was were, were, were massive, right? Um, I mean, when Occupy Walls, when, when the Occupy movement in the US um, was finally um, put down. You know that was a huge coordinated police action. Um, you know across the, the 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 whole of the US at exactly the same time, police forces, you know, highly militarized um, police forces with you know very very advanced um, sort of capabilities in terms of um, you know crowd control and dealing dealing with you know large groups of people. You know, they, they moved in and dismantled and destroyed these camps all at the same time. And I think to, to try and imagine how the Occupy movement could have withstood that and could have survived um, in some kind of real form beyond that is that's that's very, very difficult to imagine what that could have looked like. I mean, the way it did survive was into something like Occupy Sandy. So when the when Hurricane Sandy hit New York, the mutual aid network that that emerged um which was you know for for several days was the main sort of coordination of um you know aid and support and shelter and resources for people who were who were affected by this by this hurricane that was organized by people who had been part of the occupy wall street movement um, and they were applying a lot of this stuff around uh, you know, de- decentralized organization, you know, autonomous networked coordination. They were applying that to that mutual aid effort. So that's something, one of the really important things that did did emerge out of out of um Occupy in, in the US at least. Yeah. And I I think it's super important that we look at the actual experiences and not just ditch them as if everything failed. And it's super important to to kind of learn out of these experiences since we actually do want to build structures that do live on and survive, that do not kind of end when one coordinated effort through the state uh, des- destroys the the actual camps. In this case, we, we do need and do want uh, structures that survive beyond such a blow. And for this, we, we need to enrich the analytic aspect of looking at the movement of the squares and um, enrich the tactics, the strategies, and in your uh, uh, language, the grand strategies uh, that we apply in order to achieve these goals. So let's dive a little deeper into the components of anarchist cybernetics. I mean, cybernetics is kind of by definition a very broad field when it comes to anarchist cybernetics, you are specifically interested in a subfield, a subfield called organizational cybernetics. And within this subfield, you focus on the work of Stafford Beer and his viable system model. So could you give us an overview of, of the uh, VSM, the viable system model, and how it informs anarchist cybernetics? Yeah, so so the, the viable system model, I think, is really, really interesting. Um, so what it does as a kind of model of how, how any kind of system can be organized 
is it tries to sort of you know, separate out the different functions within within a system, um, and it and so and, and you know very 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 broadly it does. So there's very two very broad parts of this of this kind of model of this picture of of a effective self organizing system. So one is the kind of operational part. So you'd have you know the the actual day to day operations of, of of any system. So if we're thinking about you know something like um, I mean, yeah, we, we could look at something that Occupy Wall Street, but I think um, something I'm really interested in at the moment is thinking about how this applies to worker cooperatives. So I'll kind of take that example a bit. Um, so if we imagine a kind of a cafe that's run in a kind of, you know, collective cooperative way. So the day-to-day -day operations would be, you know, obviously, you know, you know, producing food, you know, making drinks, serving customers, um, you know, opening and closing, you know, cleaning, things like this. So you have these sort of day-to-day -day activities. Um, and then you also have how these are sort of coordinated in a very immediate way, right? So you have to make sure, for example, um, you know, if, if, if a customer puts in an order for, you know, a meal and some drinks, that, you know, okay, who's making the drinks and who's making the food? There has to be some coordination there so that, you know, they kind of arrive at the right time and the person's not, I don't know, sitting with their food for an hour before the drink comes or, or, or the, 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 the other way around. So there has to be some sort of basic coordination between these different functions. But then what the VSM does, which I think is really interesting, is it says, okay, so this is the operational part, these basic functions and how they coordinate. But we also have a kind of meta-systemic part, which is the kind of broader or, or, or more strategic coordination of sort of system or organization as as a whole so if we take this example of the kind of you know cooperative cafe this would be thinking about questions of how do how, how does the sort of business strategy de develop within this um collective um so it might be that they have weekly meetings where they you know reflect on what's happened during the week uh you know do things like you know, monitor how much stock is left, how much has been sold, whether some things are more popular than others, um, whether there's any sort of conflicts between different parts of the operation. Um, and it allows them to sort of reflect on that outside of the day-to-day -day context and sort of step out of that and say, okay, well, now we're going to look at this as, as a kind of system as a whole, and we're going to have this systemic overview of everything that's happening rather than just the day-to-day, -day, you know, it, it, immediate coordination. And I think that sort of meta system is what is really, really important with the viable systems model. Because I think it's the kind of thing that is often, there's often not that separation between the day-to-day -day operations and the sort of meta systemic you know, strategy or coordination or monitoring. Um, often when a lot of, in, 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 in a lot of ways, things like, you know, cooperatives or anarchist collectives are described in terms of organization there's a kind of mixing of these and they're kind of bound up together and they're not really not really distinguished at all and i think when that happens often what it means is that some of the key functions that as i said cybernetics identifies don't happen or don't happen well enough or you know happen at the wrong time so I think separating these things out, it allows us to sort of say, okay, we can identify what the key functions of this metasystemic strategy are, and we can make sure that they happen in the right ways. And importantly, from an anarchist perspective or from the perspective of a, of, of a um, you know, worker-owned cooperative, how can we make sure these functions are organized in a democratic and participatory way? So rather than just saying you know, with a typical business, well, there's the day-to-day -day activities and then there's the, the management activities. And you know, that sort of management decisions and management strategy, there's a select group of people who are a kind of elite within the organization who have the decision-making power over what happens there. From an anarchist perspective, separating these things out allows us to say, well, we can have these functions. We can be doing things like, you know, developing long-term strategy, um, monitoring, you know, performance in different ways, um, making decisions about 
how we can coordinate things better, how we can you know move resources around in better ways, how we can communicate in better ways. But we can do all these things in democratic and participatory ways. So it doesn't mean that we have the operational part of the organization, which is you know, the, 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 the workers, and then the meta-systemic strategy part, which is the managers. Essentially, we have the same people doing both, not at the same time, because that's when it becomes you know, too complicated and too difficult to manage, but at certain points, stepping out of the operational roles and into the strategy roles. So as I said, this could be you know, weekly meetings, monthly meetings, maybe once a year there would be a kind of larger strategy discussion. But you have these sort of moments when people can step out of their operational roles into the more sort of st- strategic roles. And that allows for um, that kind of coordination to happen in, in democratic ways. You mentioned at some point within your answer that sometimes these things get mixed up and then some of the functions actually do not really happen and are not uh, being addressed. And uh, I would add that sometimes, uh, or depending on the context, you even have the situation that people are opposed to actually applying some of these functions. I mean, in in your example of the cafe, it's... uh, a bit more relaxed, I would say, because people might intuitively uh, grasp that there is a need for some kind of higher level coordination as well. But if you take the example of a society as a whole and try to apply this lens, then you will come to uh, questions of uh, hierarchy um, versus autonomy and stuff like that. And then specifically within uh, anarchist communities, you might have some, some strong reaction actually against um, having this higher level, so to speak, coordination function being applied because it is um, perceived as a form of uh, unwanted hierarchy. So I think it, it, it would be fruitful, and this is something you do within the book uh, in a very um, good way, I would say. I think it would be fruitful to, to use the VSM as a, a diagnostic tool in order to look at some of the key principles that are uh, relevant for anarchist organization uh, from a different perspective, from the perspective of uh, anarchist cybernetics in in this case, Uh, because I think you can, um, by doing that, address some of the more fundamental open questions within anarchist uh, organizations. So maybe um, you could elaborate a bit, what does it look like to apply the viable system model to anarchist self-organization? Maybe you could give us an overview of a anarchist viable system model. Yes, yeah, so so the the way that I've done it in the book, and that's just a product of the fact that it's you know a kind of written document like like a book, is you know very much me on the outside, you know, looking at something like the Occupy movement or like I've just done for this you know um, cooperative cafe, you're know, looking at it from the outside and seeing okay how does this work in terms of a kind of viable effective system, but the way that it really ought to be applied is in a much more um, sort of participatory and involved way. So rather than someone you know, like myself standing on the outside and analysing the organisation, um, it is it's something that the people in the organisation should be doing collectively. So part of their discussions might be, okay, how can we start to understand the different functions? And um, one of the incredibly useful tools in, in doing this um, is work that was developed by um, John Walker. So John Walker was somebody who was working in a number of cooperatives in the north of England um, in the I think, sort of 1980s, 1990s, and got in contact with Stafford Beer because he started to learn about cybernetics and you know, thinking that maybe this could work for cooperatives. And what John Walker has done is he's you know, written a sort of handbook on the viable systems model for, for cooperatives. Um, and it's not explicitly anarchist, but I think it does chime incredibly well with um, an anarchist politics. Um, so what John sort of suggests is, well, I mean, he does an incredible amount of detail because he's you know tried this with different cooperatives time and again. So he's, he's worked it out, you know, in terms of that this is the process that actually works. But he basically just goes through a number of steps that you would do with a group 
so if you're in a cooperative, you, know, you, you can look at John's Viable Systems Model Guide and go through different steps, answer different questions. And what that means essentially is doing things like um, you know, trying to identify the environment that you're operating in as an organization. You know, what are the different factors involved in that environment? How does the environment change? Um, and then also positioning yourself as an organization within that. So what are the sort of interactions you have with the environment? At what points of the organization are you engaging with different situations that are maybe changing in different ways? Um, so to take the example of the cafe, for example, they might say, well, part of our environment is the, the customers that are coming in to, to the business. Um, and we have people who are engaging with them. We have, you know, cooks who are making food for them, people making drinks, people taking orders from them. Um, you have these different ways of interacting with that environment. And that's the kind of starting point, I think, for, for thinking about how this viable systems model process can work within an organization. Because once people start to do that, and, and you know, John's viable systems model guide goes through a lot of steps and a lot more detail, but you start to sort of actually identify the different functions. So you start to say, okay, what is our what 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 are our different operational parts of our organization? So as I said, it might be you know people serving customers, people you know making the food, people making the drinks, people doing the cleaning. So you can start to sort of map out the different operational parts of the organization. Um, and the way John talks about this is, you know, okay, you actually have you know, massive sheets of paper and you write all this down. You start, start to actually map out what the organization does day to day. And then you can start to think, well, how, how do these interact? So what are the points where these different functions interact with each other? Um, so when do the different operational parts come into contact? Um, and that just starts allowing you to see, okay, is there any other clashes? Is there any sort of conflict here? Are there any areas where actually the way they come into contact isn't the most effective? It creates more problems than it solves. So you can start to sort of help with some of the coordination that way, just by mapping out those interactions. But then you can also go to the next kind of metasystemic level and start to say, okay, within the organization, where is it we are doing strategy, for example? Right. Where is it we are thinking about, you know, long-term planning? Is this something we are doing? Um, and again, you can sort of map this out in the big piece of paper. It's you say, well, okay, we have this monthly meeting. Where, 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 where we do this? Um, or maybe we don't. Maybe we need to start doing it. Maybe we need to have a monthly meeting where we talk about strategy. Um, where we look at what's happening outside the business and the environment, but also what's happening within it. So what kind of changes are happening? Is there any conflicts? Are there any difficulties? Are there any you know, issues that are developing? You can have that internal and external view. And also you can start saying, okay, how are we actually monitoring what's happening? Do we have any functions within our organization for actually keeping a track of what's happening day to day? Um, so that we can then say, well, this, this works really well, this doesn't work really well, this could be better this way, this could be more effective if it was done like this. If, if you start mapping out these functions of how are we monitoring things, how are we developing a long-term strategy, um, it allows you to see, okay, maybe we could be doing these better, or maybe if we're not doing them, we can start doing them. Maybe we can learn from what other cooperatives are doing around this. Um, and I think these are these are the steps that you know something like a you know anarchist collective, a cooperative, even just a community of people living together could be going through. So it's taking that time to actually sit down and have discussions about what is it we're doing day to day, how is that coordinated? Could that coordination be made more effective now that we've started to map it out and actually look at it in in, in this kind of you know have this sort of overview. But then also, how are we actually monitoring things? How are we checking that things are working okay? Um, that could be monitoring performance. Also, just checking, uh, is everyone happy in the organization? Does everyone still feel you know, fulfilled? Does everyone still feel at home in this community? You can start checking for these things in, in more, more conscious ways, I think, and then building a strategy that takes all of this into account.
while you were answering, I'm thinking like, all right, this very much uh, sounds like something that already happens within our societies today in the form of business consulting, so to speak. And this is, of course, not a coincidence because Stefan Beer was a business consultant as well. So um, I think it would be important to kind of tie this back to why this kind of thinking is actually also fruitful for um, trying to achieve some of the, the normative goals of anarchism as well, because otherwise people might hear uh, you talk and think, oh, well, uh -huh, Thomas is trying to get into the uh, business uh, of business consulting. <laughs> uh, so how is this in line with coming to a post-capitalist uh, anarchist cybernetic world, so to speak? But It, it actually is helpful as well. And I think it would be uh, important for us to kind of carve out how and why. And one way of doing it would be through uh, taking some of these core principles and trying to uh, figure out what they mean within anarch anarchism and what they mean within cybernetics. So you already mentioned self-organization a couple of times and how this was one of the gateways that led you to cybernetics because you immediately thought, all right, this is something uh, of an interesting overlap. So could you maybe explain what uh, self-organization means within the different fields? Yeah, so I think in in cybernetics, self organization is is just quite quite a technical term. So it's quite a sort of descriptive technical term for for how a system is organized. And you know, uh, an electronic system or a mechanical system can be self organized, right? So the sort of classic example is the um, steam engine, which has you know a certain part of the mechanism is a thing called a governor, which is basically a way to regulate speed. So you know, as the engine speeds up, um, the governor's, you know, kind of, well, it's hard to sort of describe it without, without a picture in, in, in front of me. But, you know, as the engine speeds up, the governor responds to that speed um, and the way it responds slows the system down. Right. So it's, it's a way where the system can regulate itself. Um, thermostats do that as well. Okay, you know, thermostats, when, they get, when the room gets above a certain temperature, The air conditioning will come on and bring the temperature back down. So, in cybernetics terms, that's that's self self organized, right? Because no one's having to manually adjust the speed of the engine. Um, I'm not in my room having to constantly go back and turn the air conditioning on when it gets too hot, and then turn it off again when it's too cold. You know, the, the thermostat does that itself. But obviously, that's very different from how we think about self organization in political terms. So when, when we're talking about self-organization in political terms, it's on the one hand taking in that kind of technical definition of saying, okay, how can you know a, a collective, a community, a cooperative, um, a social movement, how can it perform the tasks that, that it wants to perform, achieve the goals that it wants to achieve um, in a sort of self-regulating way where it doesn't need Uh, you know, leadership clique or you know, a leadership party to actually do it, do the controlling. It just does it itself through how it's through how it's how it's organized and how it communicates. Um, so it, it, there is that technical element in there, but there's also importantly the the political element, which is very much saying, well, okay, self organization is actually about everyone being able to participate in the decisions. That have that 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 have any impact on their lives, so it's about a sort of participatory and democratic way of organizing a, a, in any kind of community or collective. So in that way, self organization is less about how technically efficient it is or effective it is, and much more about well, it allows us to you know develop ourselves in a sort of free and autonomous way, both collectively and as individuals. Um, and you know, for for the anarchists, this is very very closely linked to ideas of human flourishing. So, how can we actually develop ourselves as you know some kind of rounded, um, you know, happy in individuals with the you know with the kind of resources um, for for genuine well being? 
Um, how can we do that in a community which is um, collectively self-organized? So how is you know, my individual freedom linked to the collective process of self-organization where we are as a group, you know, free and autonomous and making our own decisions? Um, so I think self-organization is, is these two different things. It's on the one hand, the technical thing of this, the, the, this is the most effective way of organizing systems um, and also the political thing of this is the, the way that communities or collectives can be organized that gives us the most freedom, that gives us the mo most um, opportunity. <clears throat> yeah, that, that, that gives us the most opportunity for collective and individual autonomy and fulfillment. And I think anarchism has always had its eye on both of these. So even if you look back to some of the classical anarchists, like um, Peter Kropotkin, who was you know, an anarchist geographer writing at the end of the 19th century and start of the 20th century, um, you know, he very much sees anarchism as being a politically desirable system of governance, whereby people have more freedom, people are happier, people have more well-being, people are able to look after themselves much better, they have better economic standards, um, but also a much more effective way of organising society. Because he says, well, the state is this very slow, very cumbersome, very blunt tool for trying to organise society. Um, if we can do this autonomously, it, we, we allow for much more harmony with nature. It allows us to have a much better alignment with um, how, how, how nature operates and we can build our communities in ways that are more sustainable with the, the way that change and the way that self-organization happens in, in natural systems as well. Maybe I would add, and this is maybe already an, a learning, so to speak, also from the experiences, um, for example, in, in the movement of the squares since you point out that ideally you you have these two elements of self-organization as um, two sides of the same coin so you have um, the normative ideal of self-organization as well as a effective uh, self-organization through allowing a form of distributed control so to speak i would maybe add that i understood the book as if you wanted to say that You can have both of these, but in order to get them, you would have to organize in a specific way. So it's not that you can just merely decentralize, as people might have thought uh, about anarchism for actually a long period. You cannot do merely that and think that you can have the effective uh, side of, um, of self-organization as well, but you would have to think about the ways in which the organization is structured in a very specific way, and that's why you take the, the, the VSM. And I already um, mentioned control. I think it would be good to maybe take a look at this term as well, because this is something that uh, might uh, lead to some misunderstandings, specifically amongst people. Uh, uh, anarchist circles i would say because uh, of course there, there might be a reflex to think that control is like Im immediate control of uh, domination of one of them the domination of one person over another but uh, within cybernetics uh, this is thought of very differently so could you maybe uh, elaborate how the term control is being used in the context of anarchist cybernetics and then we will go from there yeah so i think i think you're totally right i think there is it is There's, there's a few sort of pieces of terminology in thinking about anarchist cybernetics that do rub up against how we typically think of anarchist politics. And I think control is definitely one of them. So typically, you know, we think of control as kind of um, command and control hierarchies where, you know, control means domination. It means, you know, someone subordinating someone else, you know, someone following the orders from someone above them that they're... that person above them is, is in, in control of them. Um, and I think what cybernetics allows us to do is think about that in a very, very different way. So it's much more, control is much more, as, as I've sort of discussed already, you know, like the way self-organization operates in systems, 
according to cybernetics, um, you know, the most sort of effective way for self-organization to operate is without any kind of, you know, centralized or external control. So you think, well, what's, what's actually happening in these systems? They are still coordinated. They are still making complex decisions. They are still, um, you know, responding in a coordinated and collective way to changes and um, complexity in their environments. And that is all happening through control. So the system, in a sense, controls itself. Um, so it's that's where you know, sort of self-organization, so self-control. And it's much less, you know, we, even the term self-control, you know, we think of self-control as like the individual trying to control our passions in some way. It, it, it's much less of that. It's much more, you know, if, if we're in a group of people and we make a decision collectively, we agree on something and we do that, then we have, you know, control over ourselves. We've we've been able to do something coordinated and in an effective and democratic way. So that's how control operates. And I think there's there, there's a few sort of um, metaphors for how control operates in cybernetics. So um, Elena Leonard, who's one of the sort of foremost um, authors within the sort of organizational cybernetics tradition, describes it as a kind of balancing. So if you imagine one of the sort of metaphors is like um, someone skiing downhill. So, I mean, I've, I've, I've never skied, but I can kind of imagine what, what skiing is like. You know, you're kind of moving from side to side. You're kind of adapting to the environment, shifting with how, you know, how, how the ground changes, what's in front of you. Um, you're in some kind of you know, self-organized control where you're feeding back from the environment. You're taking in what's happening around about you, you're steering yourself in subtle ways. It's not a sort of, there's, there's not somebody on the outside pulling your strings, essentially. Um, I think another really, really nice metaphor for this, and this is um, in a book by a uh, um, Dutch anarchist, Rule van Down. So he wrote a book called Message of a Wise Kabouter. So Kabouter is a kind of gnome, and he describes Peter Kropotkin as a kind of gnome-like figure and um, so you know gnomes like sort of you know short with big beards kind of and and for, for van down there's an element of you know gnomes um live in a more har- harmonious way with nature and but he he describes it possibly a very very dutch example in terms of riding a bicycle right so he says you know, okay so you're riding a bicycle and um, obviously you're steering so you're in control that way but there's also there's wind coming in from different sides. The wind maybe blows you, and so you lean very, very slightly to one side um, to sort of counteract the wind. Um, maybe you go around a corner, so you lean in a slightly different way to allow yourself to go around the corner on the bicycle. All of these are parts of a sort of very subtle system of control. It's taking information from the environment. The wind's blowing this way. I'm feeling that. In, in, in myself and feeling myself be shifted one way so I can subtly lean the other way. It's not even necessarily totally conscious. Um, it's something we, we probably do quite, well, at least if we're, if we're used to cycling, it's something we do quite quite um, naturally without thinking about it. And I think that that kind of control, so imagining someone cycling and you know responding to the wind and managing to keep themselves going, I think is really, really important. But I think the metaphor of the bicycle is really, really interesting for me because it tells us how important the environment is here so if you imagine you know cycling on a on a on a um, bicycle track or a bicycle lane you know if that bicycle lane had incredibly sharp corners in it you know you'd really really struggle to get around those corners you'd really you'd have to step off the bike and turn the bike around and then start again um, I, I'm, I'm sure in Germany you've got really, really good bicycle lanes. In the UK, we either have none, or if we do have them, they're just useless and terrible. Um, so I think that for me, that tells us how important the sort of environmental conditions are to to how we can sort of control, have that sort of self-organized kind of control. It's not just about what we do as an organization, as a collective. It's also about the environment we are in and how the environment is structured. Does the environment allow us to have some kind of self-organization and have that kind of um, that kind of balancing idea of, of, of control? And there are some very nice 
kind of phrases within your book as well, which try to give an idea of how this relation is thought of. For example, control is in each function, not top down, or the control function is spread throughout the architecture of the system. So this very much highlights this idea of not having like one centralized body that gives out, out orders and everybody else is supposed to follow. However, and uh, this is something that we uh, definitely uh, will have to talk about and which is very interesting, I think, in the way that you approach is anarchist cybernetics does not say that there is like full autonomy for everybody so that everybody could simply do what he or she or they um, might uh, want to do in a given situation and actually approach some form of highly individualistic autonomy, so to speak. Instead, you try to approach the, the question of autonomy as well as the question of uh, freedom and hier hierarchy. And um, you try to approach these questions from a different angle. So uh, you propose, uh, for example, functional hierarchy instead of a structural hierarchy. So Maybe let's take a look at these different elements and start with the question of hierarchy. What's the difference between the two uh, forms of hierarchy that you describe, functional hierarchy and structural hierarchy, and why might functional hierarchy serve us better? Yeah, so the, the distinction between functional and structural hierarchy, so that's something that comes from um, Gordon Pask, who was another of the really sort of influential cyberneticians in the Yeah, sort of post post World War II years, um, so a, a very close friend of Stafford Beers, and he sort of makes this. I mean, he's his his interest is more in um, you know communication systems and electronic systems. He's he's less interested in social systems, although he uses them as examples an awful lot. And he is very political in what he writes, but he makes this distinction to try and say we have the sort of structural hierarchy within a system which is within an organization is how we would typically think of a hierarchical organizational chart. So you have the boss at the top, you maybe have sort of, you know, senior managers, then below them, you maybe have, you know, middle managers, and then you have maybe workers at the very bottom. But essentially you have a sort of top-down decision-making structure. So it's hierarchical in the sense that um, decisions are made at the top, and then those decisions are fed down through the hierarchy, To people at the bottom who just have to implement those decisions. They don't have any, any autonomy, any say in anything, no decision-making power. They just implement those decisions. So that's a, that's a structural hierarchy. And that's obviously um, the kind of thing that anarchists are, you know, as, as a kind of starting point for anarchism, very much opposed to. Functional hierarchy is something quite different. So functional hierarchy is instead saying that they're is a kind of logical ordering of decision-making whereby some decisions come logically prior to other decisions. Um, so one way of thinking about this is in terms of, you know, the kind of strategy and tactics distinction. So as I kind of mentioned, looking at the VSM, you have this higher function metasystemic part of the system, um, which is where things like, you know, grand strategy and strategy are developed. And in, in, in a sort of, in terms of thinking about this as, as a kind of effective organization, those are decisions that come before the operational or tactical decisions. Um, so in order for us to know what tactics are going to be best to us, in order for us to know how we can um, best operate in the kind of day-to-day -day of, of an organization, we need to have a strategy first. So we develop a strategy that tells us this, these are our goals, these are our aims, these are the values and principles that we have, these are our priorities, this is what we need to you know, maximize and minimize, um, and that helps us decide on what kind of tactics, what kind of day-to-day -day, um, actions we can take. So in a sense, there's a sort of hierarchical ordering there, you know, strategy comes above tactics. And obviously, in typical organizations, that functional hierarchy and the structural hierarchy are meshed together. So you have, you know, the strategic decisions are taken by the bosses, by the managers, and the tactical stuff, the actions, the day-to-day -day actions are things that workers are doing. 
and they just take the orders and, and, and do the actions as they're told to do. Um, what I think anarchist cybernetics opens up, I think this is something that's in cybernetics anyway, but I think an anarchist focus on cybernetics helps us sort of reinforce this and helps us, you know, see how important this is. Is saying we can have the functional hierarchy, so we can have the logical ordering of decision making where one decision has to be made in order for us to be able to make the other decision. So one decision is higher than the other. We can have that logical ordering, we can have that hierarchy of decision making without the structural hierarchy. So as I said, looking at the VSM and that example of the cafe, you know, the people who are doing the day-to-day -day activities, the people who are doing the tactical action, which is you know, functionally lower than the strategic decision making, they are the same people who are doing the, the strategic decision making. And there's not a manager who's making those strategy decisions. There's not a boss who's making those decisions. It's the same people who are doing you know, the serving, the making the drinks, the cooking. They, at a certain point, stop doing that and they go into a meeting where, they, or they go into a discussion, they go into some kind of forum where they're doing the strategy stuff. So it's very much saying we can have the functional ordering of decision-making where some decisions have to come first and then we can make other ones. But everybody in the organization can be involved at all levels of that functional hierarchy. Um, so it doesn't require a structural hierarchy where certain decisions can only be made by people higher up in the, in the organization. And I want to add maybe for the audience that is on the critical side of things when it comes to uh, cybernetics I, i want to add that uh, since we do already have cybernetics very much within our world today acting as a actually maybe even already at least in some parts hegemonic principle <laughs> i would like to add that if you take a look at capitalist cybernetics and the way in which like huge companies like google uh, facebook amazon whatever apply cybernetic thinking that they do exactly what you just mentioned they collapse functional hierarchy and structural hierarchy and they try to make use of uh, elements of uh, functional hierarchy where lower elements within the organization might have some limited autonomy in order to become more effective but they do still keep the structural hierarchy in which at the end you do have the bosses you do have the managers you do have the people who will tell you what to do and uh, And this is very much structured along uh, strong hierarchies. So this is something um, I'm, uh, I actually want to point out at this point, I would say. And uh, again, I think this uh, also shows how this lens is actually very fruitful as an analytic lens because it makes you see the difference. So this is something I, I really like when, when reading your book. And still, um, when it comes to anarchist cybernetics we do have to point out that as i said it's not about having like unrestricted autonomy since you do have these elements of grand strategy you do have these elements everybody will have to be on board with so to speak and because of that you automatically have some boundaries uh, um, in terms of your own individual autonomy because uh, it actually is a logical result of uh, having decisions being made collectively beforehand and yourself having to kind of align with this overarching identity and principles of the uh, organization so to speak so maybe let's talk about this relation uh, let's talk about this question of uh, autonomy that is implicit within this uh, relation uh, because both in anarchism and cybernetics aut autonomy plays a very crucial role however again Uh, we find very different understandings 
understandings of what uh, autonomy means in the respective uh, fields. Stafford B identifies uh, three constraints on autonomy, and this is specifically interesting when it comes to anarchist cybernetics because uh, some of these constraints uh, seem to, at least at first sight, go against the grain of some of the core principles of anarchist organization. Again, we have to say. <laughs> um, but I, I think you do a good job in, in the book uh, in pointing out why these constraints are actually not only necessary, but also compatible with an anarchist approach. And these constraints are, and I will read them out. These, uh, this is a quote of, uh, by Stafford Beer. Uh, the first of the constraints would be autonomous parts must operate in coordination with other autonomous parts. The second one is autonomous parts must operate within the intentions of the whole organization. And, and this would be the third one. Autonomous parts must face the possibility of being excluded from the organization as a whole. So these are the three constraints. Um, what is the understanding of autonomy in anarchist cybernetics? Yes, I think as, as you sort of suggested, it, it at first does seem like it clashes with how we may understand um, autonomy or, or freedom. And I think I'm, I'm collapsing these terms, autonomy and freedom. There is you know, a discussion about whether there's a distinction between them, but I'm kind of collapsing them a bit. Um, there is different definite question here about does the sort of understanding of autonomy that's in cybernetics fundamentally clash with how we understand it in anarchism. Um, so I think going through those three, the, 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 those three, three principles that you that, that you just read out, um, I think for the first two, there's not necessarily a problem there. So, you know, saying that the autonomous parts have to be in coordination with other autonomous parts, you know, that's just that sort of fundamental thing of saying, okay, it's my, my, my autonomy shouldn't constrain your autonomy and your autonomy shouldn't constrain my autonomy. So, okay, we can be auto autonomous, um, but we have to sort of coordinate that autonomy so that, you know, the, like me trying to be to be free or be autonomous doesn't prevent you from being free or being autonomous. Right? We have to just make sure there's some kind of coordination there. And that might mean, um, you know, certain limits on, on, on what we can do as individuals, but ultimately it's there so that, you know, There's, there's a sort of maximum amount of autonomy that means that everyone can still still enjoy it. Um, the second part, I think, also isn't necessarily, doesn't necessarily immediately suggest a clash with anarchism. So thinking about, well, the autonomous parts of an organization um, need to operate within the intentions of the whole organization. Um, so that's something kind of, you know, fa fairly fairly accepted within a lot of anarchist organization. You know, yes, different parts of a, of, of a federation or different branches of an organization will have some autonomy, they'll have some sort of freedom to make their own decisions in their own environments, in their own in environmental niches. Um, but they're still part of the organization as a whole. And there's going to be some decisions which are at a kind of higher level of, in a sort of functionally higher level of decision making, where they might not have complete autonomy, right? So because because they're still part of the whole organization. So for example, if this is I don't know an anarchist trade union, for example, there's going to be different branches of that trade union which have autonomy to do maybe organize on different priorities, um, you know, maybe pick their own campaigns, divide up, you know, workloads in, in their own autonomous ways raise money themselves, manage their finances themselves in autonomous ways. But there's going to be some kind of key organizational principles that they don't have autonomy over. So for example, I'm thinking of the um, industrial workers of the world here. You know, part of their sort of fundamental, you know, it's the, the fundamental starting point for, these, for their politics is that people who are bosses, um, or people who have any power over, you know, any direct power over hiring and firing workers can't be a member of the of, of the union because then they're they're on the boss side rather than on the worker side. So if a particular branch of the IWW said, well, you know, we'd, we'd quite like to invite this boss in because he seems like a nice person, got, seems like they've got good politics, talks good, we're, we're friends with them, we want them to be a member. 
that that's not going to be possible within that organization. So their autonomy is restricted there by virtue of the fact that they're part of this larger organization. So I think that's not necessarily um, an issue for, or doesn't present itself as an issue for, for, for anarchists. I think the third principle that you mentioned is perhaps where we might imagine that there's a more fundamental clash. So the idea that um, there's a kind of ultimate restriction on autonomy, which is being excluded from the organization. So there, there's, a, there's a point when, for, for whatever reason, a certain part of the organization or a certain individual might be excluded, might be kicked out of, of the organization, whatever kind of organization it is, you know, a federation, a collective, whatever. And that's something that I think some anarchists may at first find issue with because issue with because they'd say, well, no, we 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 don't want to be excluding people. We don't want to be, you know, doing that horrible thing of saying to someone, yeah, you're you're no you're no longer part of the group. We 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 don't want you in this organization. We're going to evict you or expel you or whatever. But actually this is something which which happens not maybe maybe not regularly, but it is a tool within the kind of anarchist toolbox. So particularly if we think about things like when um, certain individuals have been accused of committing sexual assault, for example, um, and maybe haven't you know, put me part of the sort of the kind of transformative justice process within a collective is saying, okay, we'll have some kind of accountability process, we'll have some kind of process of mediation um, where hopefully we can still all live together. You know, the person who committed the assault can hopefully learn what they did wrong and, you know, grow as a person and won't do that again. The person who is who is the victim accepts that that process is fair and thinks, yep, yeah, okay, we can, we can still exist as a collective. But then there might be a problem, a point where that breaks down. And actually it's impossible for, you know, the person who committed the sexual assault to actually remain part of that collective or part of that community. It's, it's no longer considered safe for the other people for them to be part of that community. And that's, that's the kind of worst case scenario, perhaps, in terms of thinking around anarchist and radical approaches to justice. But it is something that happens. And when that happens, you know, expelling a person from the organisation um, evicting them from from the community is a kind of you know tool that people have in that circumstance. So it is something that it's something we we don't don't like to acknowledge as being. Hey, here's the things we can do. We can do this, this, and this. And one of them is we can expel you if you do these things. But it is there. It is there as a kind of if 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 this goes as horribly as we can possibly imagine, and we can no longer have this person in the organization, in the community, in the collective, then expelling them is, is an option. And for most anarchist groups, that will be part of how they, how they can resolve these kind of conflicts. As I said, worst case, but it is still there. So I think that, that potential for expulsion is, is, is something we maybe don't want to be doing, but it's something we recognise as, as anarchists that there, there may still be a necessity for that um, at certain times. And I think it does raise a lot of issues of, well, where does that person go, right? Does that person just, is that person just out in the wilderness now? Are they, um, how, you know, how, how, how are they going to learn from this? How are they going to change? Does it really, does it really um, change the underlying structural situations around things like like you know sexual assault and, and, and violence um how, how does it help us transform as a community it raises a lot of questions but it is still still an important part of, of trying to deal with you know conflict and deal with justice in more more anarchistic ways and maybe because this might lead to forms of misunderstanding as well because when you talked about um, part one within these constraints about um, autonomous parts must operate in coordination with other autonomous parts and you framed it in a way that points out that 
you have your freedoms, I have my freedoms, and as long as they don't infringe on each other, it's, it's, it's all fine. But the part within the book uh, about autonomy very much highlights how individual freedom is a product of collective freedom and, uh, and not vice versa. And, and uh, I think this is just something that I, I would like to, to add because um, it might otherwise lead uh, to, to misunderstandings when people hear you talk about these individuals and not infringing on the freedom of others, because this is, uh, of course, one of the ways that it is being conceptualized, for example, in liberalism. You know, have these, um, the, these nomads, these individual nomads that are <laughs> enacting in contractual relations with each other um, and very much uh, thought of... Uh, through a lens of methodological individualism, and that's not the way that you uh, approach it, uh, I would say. Yeah, definitely. I think I think that, that that's really, really important. So when we do look at something like, yeah, those sort of um, um, restrictions on individual autonomy, it's it's not that it's not coming from that methodological individualist starting point. It's very much saying any kind of individual freedom is a product of. The, the collective existing of being part of a community. So it's not that you have these autonomous individuals who come into an organization and then have to coordinate. It's that you know the organization or the community produces the kind of autonomy and the freedom that these individuals have. But part of that process of producing that freedom is a coordination so that the sort of freedoms and autonomies are kind of balanced and work together and don't don't conflict with one another um, and, and I think that I mean that's something we see in sort of anarchism going way back that recognition of individuality and individual freedom are a product of you know community and a product of collective organization um, rather than you know the kind of liberal starting point which is we are we're individuals and we can maybe for our mutual benefit cooperate it's much more cooperation comes first And this is also, I think, very much important because it points towards the, the importance of how this collective element comes about. Because if it comes about in a, in a, a participatory way, then the likelihood of the uh, individuals that are <laughs> engaging with this collective, uh, of agreeing with, um, with the um, limitations on their own autonomy is, um, of course, um, much much higher than than if not. And I think this very much relates to this question of grant strategy, or within the VSM, it's called System Five, and how these overarching goals, this grant strategy uh, actually comes about, how it is being developed, because this is the, the crucial point where anarchist cybernetics um, um, is very much different from, uh, as I already pointed out, for example, capitalist cybernetics, because this um, uh, level of grant strategy, this um, level five within the VSM, um, is very much um, part of a participatory uh, process uh, as well and needs to come about through such a process. And I think immediately some questions pop up <laughs> as, as well, because if you think of it in a larger context, if you think of anarchist cybernetics as something that might eventually inform society-wide organization, then the question of scale comes into mind immediately, because if uh, you um, want the level five elements, the grand strategy elements to come about in a participatory way through consensus decisions, for example, then you will have a problem if uh, you have a large quantity of uh, people and uh, you will have to find ways to, to address this in a way that still leads to this legitimization Uh, through process that is actually a constitutive element um, of anarchist cybernetics. So how would this uh, level five uh, function, this grand strategy come about within anarchist cybernetics also on a scale? Yeah, so I think, I think the, one of the best examples, I think, of, well, I think the starting point is thinking, well, what, what is this system five? So what is grand strategy? Um, so the way... The way I understand it and the way it's understood in cybernetics um, is 
thinking about the um, identity or the ethos of a particular organization or a particular community. So what are the kind of core principles? What are the what is the sort of you know paradigm or worldview um of of a particular community? What is the core elements of how that community views itself and understands itself, you know, as a community with a certain identity? And that's because that embodies things like you know values and principles, thinking about you know that sort of functional hierarchy of decision making, you know, that sort of that system five level of or, or grand grand strategic level of you know, values and principles identity that then determines what kind of practical strategies are going to be developed in an organization which then in turn de- determines what kind of tactics are going to be appropriate within the organization and um, so there's a strong link between the day-to-day activities um how they are considered to be appropriate for the organization and the kind of identity and the ethos and the values and principles that that organization has. So how that actually comes about in anarchist cybernetics is really, really, really important question. Um, there are elements of it which are which make up an almost a kind of common sense within a particular, you know, political milieu or political tradition. So some of it's going to be things that maybe isn't ever ever even explicitly discussed or isn't ever you know the, the subject of an actual concrete decision that people make it might be, be that the people involved come into an organization or come into a setting or decide to form a kind of community um, or just want to think about who, who are we as a group we, we already exist as a group but let's think about who we are as a group there might be things that are just so taken for granted that they never have to be a decision made about them. They're just a common sense almost. Um, so for example, you know, thinking about, um, again, going back to the example of the industrial workers of the World Trade Union, you know, part of the sort of common sense, the sort of taking for granted common sense of that organization is the particular political view of economic exploitation, right? That there are you know, wealthy capitalists who own the, the the means for production and there are the working class who have to sell their labor in order to survive i think if you go to a iww meeting even a big sort of strategic meeting today they're not going to be saying okay do, do we still agree with this do we still do, do we need to reaffirm our agreement to this principle that's just the kind of common sense for that whole politics um so that's part of their identity, part of their worldview. But then there's going to be elements of it that do need to be discussed at some point. Um, and I think one of the fruitful ways of thinking about that is through um, things like constitutions. So you said about how groups constitute themselves. Um, and part of that is thinking about, well, what, what values do we all agree on? What, what kind of identity do we all share as people in this organisation? Um, or different organizations within a kind of federation of some kind. So that process can be quite explicit in those terms. And if we look back at something like Occupy Wall Street, you know, they had, you know, participatory, um, you know, collective democratic processes of um, writing and agreeing on a declaration. So it's kind of trying to mirror the idea of the US Declaration of Independence, which was obviously written by, you know, a few white men, a lot of them slave owners, and you know, all, 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 all kind of wealthy landowners. Um, what Occupy did was say, okay, we, we need to create a declaration for ourselves as a, as a community, but we're going to do that in a democratic way. We're going to do that in a participatory way. And it's going to be based on everyone taking part in that process. So that's a much more explicit way of doing that kind of system five grand strategy of saying we can define who we are as a community we can define what our core principles are what our values are um, and we can write that in a document so they they produced the kind of declaration of of occupy wall street so that was their sort of founding founding document so i think there's ways that you can do that in organizations and you know 
in sort of smaller organisations like um, workers' cooperatives, there's going to be some kind of constitution. There's going to be some kind of um, founding statement or statement of principles, which at some point in the organisation you might um, either need to write from scratch or you might need to, if it already exists, you know, go back to it and change things as time goes on. So those documents aren't necessarily fixed forever. They can maybe change in some ways, although some elements might be less changeable than others. But I think how you then scale that up, so okay, it worked well for, you can imagine it working in a small workers' cooperative if there's like 10 people. You can say, well, we, we, we can get together for a day and we can just work this out. Okay, great. Occupy Wall Street, okay, a few thousand people took part in that. Still relatively small groups and they and they developed really, really good ways of making sure everyone could take part, making sure everyone could feed ideas in, but still relatively small group. How do we do that at the scale of something like the size of uh, a city or even you know a, 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 a country? Well, then we need to think about some of the really, really interesting examples around the world of more participatory processes for writing a national constitution. Um, so no, none of these are, are, are anarchist in, 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 in any way, but I think they do have a lot of really important lessons for anarchism in the sense that they start to show us how um, a community at that scale, so you know, hundreds of thousands, maybe even millions of people can do this kind of system five grand strategy. Um, and how they can do that in a way that's more participatory than it traditionally has been done. So traditionally, a document like a national constitution is you know, maybe written by a small number of, of constitutional legal experts um, and maybe some involvement from politicians. Maybe there's some kind of consultation that feeds into it so that the people in the country have some kind of say in it. Maybe it goes to a you know, vote afterwards where people have to approve this new constitution. But with a lot of cases around the world, um, there's, there, there's a lot of examples of people trying to say, how can we open this process up and make it much more participatory, um, involve much more people, not just in throwing ideas in and then approving the document, but actually taking part in writing it. Um, and I think one of the examples I've studied is there's lots of others, but one of the examples I've studied is Iceland. Um, so they went through a process um, which hasn't been successful yet, but it's a really, really interesting process nonetheless. Um, where after the 2008 financial crash, they decided to try and rewrite the national constitution. But the way they did that, they wanted it to be more participatory. They thought, well, we want everyone in the country to have more of a direct say in how this document looks because this document is ultimately saying this is who we are as a community and this is what we believe in and these are our fundamental principles and values so they tried to find ways of making it more participatory it still wasn't you know participatory in the way that anarchists would like but it does start to point us in the direction of you know, this is um, this is something we can do now, and we've got we've got the tools to do this now. Um, you know, we we can we can use a lot of the kind of digital tools that have been developed on recently. A lot of the communication technologies; these make it much easier for lots of different people in a large area to take part in the discussion. Um, and it doesn't need to be you know everyone in one big you know general assembly. You know, we're not talking about having a Zoom call with like. 3 million people trying to, trying to agree on something, you can sort of decentralize this and split this up into small working groups. So it might be different parts of the community in different geographical areas um, have their discussions and then they have delegates that feed those discussions into some kind of slightly more centralized council or committee. Um, there may be different special interests groups. You might have, you know, uh, like, like Occupy Wall Street did, you had um, the People of Colour Caucus, so that people of colour in Occupy Wall Street had some kind of representation um, in, in, in the decision-making structures. So you can have, there's different ways of sort of 
organizing that kind of mass participation um, that's still democratic, that's still participatory, but that doesn't mean we're just saying, let's get everyone together and try and discuss and agree on something. So it's a more a more effective way of doing it that kind of breaks it up in, in, in little ways. And also a process that makes sure that it's not always the same people that engage in it, because I mean, that's a bit of a problem with the participatory approach is that at least as societies are organized right now, if you simply say, let's do it in a participatory fashion, then you will have some people that have actually the luxury to have free time in order to participate and others do not and stuff like that. So this needs to be addressed as well, of course. But okay, so I mean, what I can hear here is that um, you're leaning towards some form of anarchist constitutionalism in order to address this a question of um, system five and grand strategy, actually. We kind of talked a lot about um, organization up until now within this conversation, but your book uh, actually has a second part, <laughs> which is not about organization, but about communication. And some might remember Norbert Wiener's book title, A Cybernetics, Control and Communication in the Animal and the Machine. And you equally highlight both of these elements, control and communication. So maybe let's turn towards the communication part. What is it that communication does? What role does it play in anarchist cybernetics? So I think really fundamentally for um, so for cybernetics in general, um, thinking about self-organization is at the same time thinking about communication. So thinking about how information is you know gathered and processed and shared and distributed within a system um, is, is is incredibly central to that. So one of the sort of primary um, mechanisms within a self-organized system is um, feedback loops. So, you know, what, what I was talking about when I talked about the kind of steam engine governor or the thermostat, that's a kind of feedback loop, okay? And it operates through information. So, you know, the thermostat, as the temperature in the room, you know, increases, um, there's, there's the sort of temperature sensor in the thermostat that sends information to a different part of the thermostat, which turns the air conditioning on, for example. So that communication in that sense of information being taken in from the environment and you know, shared in the system and then an action being the outcome of that information is really fundamental to cybernetics. And some of the more sort of technical um, and I think sort of, um, yeah, looking at cybernetics in terms of electronic systems and mechanical systems, a lot of the focus was on how do we make these communication um, pathways and channels more efficient? So how, how do we minimize noise in these systems? How do we ensure that information is you know, intact when it gets to the point of the system where it needs to be? So how does it get from you know, the sort of sensor that takes that's measuring something in the environment how does that information then get to the part of the system where the action needs to happen so that's really important for a lot that's from more technical side of cybernetics but i think it's also incredibly important in thinking about how self-organization operates in social systems um because everything i've kind of talked about so far in terms of organization this is this all requires interaction between parts of a system um, and that interaction is communication okay even sometimes it will be people literally talking to one another and um, sometimes it will be um you know monitoring of of different parts of the environment or what's happening within the organization and um, sometimes it might be you know just a kind of physical interaction you know if i mean one, one of the examples I, i often think of is um working working behind a bar so i don't know if you've ever worked worked in a in, in a bar but you know when when you first start working with people and you and, and it's busy you're constantly bumping into each other you have this sort of physical and, and then eventually you sort of learn to move around each other you sort of have this yeah you kind of self-organize as a kind of system behind behind the bar but you know that sort of physical bumping and that's that's the kind of communication as well because that's sending a 
information signal of, right, I need to move this way instead, or we need to go a different direction kind of thing. So all of this kind of coordination, all this self-organization is about, you know, communicating and making sure information moves through the system in, um, you know, effective ways that allow people to know what's happening and make decisions as a result of, of, of what's happening. So also in terms of strategy, you know, strategy can't happen effectively if we don't have, you know, information that's being communicated from the day-to-day activities and from, from the environment itself. You know, strategy can't happen within a kind of bubble where there's no information coming into it, right? It has to have information. And that, that means you have to have some kind of communication, um, you know, effective communication systems within an organization. So in, you know, small collectives and the kind of, you know, small workers cooperative, that might be very, very simple where the communication is just, we talk to each other, you know, we, 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 we tell each other what's happening. We you know, have a meeting every week where we, we go around and everyone says, okay, this is what happened this week and this went wrong. And so the information is shared within, within the system, quite simply. But if we think about sort of larger systems, we need to think about, okay, how do we, how do we create specific communication channels so that the right information is going to the right places? Um, so the right information is collected, but also presented in the most effective ways. And also, you know, an important part for cybernetics is how do we sort of manage the, the um, um, amount of information? So we don't want to be flooded with too much. We need to kind of filter some stuff out. We need to you know, dampen down some of that massive variety of information so that we can actually use it in in effective and practical ways but developing communication systems so that information can be taken in travel around the organization to the places it's needed people can make decisions based on the right information that that's incredibly important and that's all communication some of it's talking some of it will be different different forms of communicating information And I think uh, related to that, and this is also, I think, important in order to highlight that cybernetics itself also is not innocent. (laughs) It kind of um, formats things in specific ways. It makes you look at uh, processes in specific ways and thereby having uh, certain imperatives uh, um, inscribed in it as well. And some of them um, might be desirable, others maybe not. So um, maybe just to to highlight this uh, as well, that a process of reflection upon this um, Uh, processes of formatting uh, within cybernetics would be uh, useful as well and one of the things or one of the ways that you do reflect upon this is when it comes to the specific way that information is thought about within cybernetics because very much at the beginning of cybernetics there um, is information theory uh, developed by Claude Shannon uh, which does a formatting when it comes to information and it's a specific type of formatting that has a specific idea of what is noise and what is not and what should be eliminated um, because it is termed noise. So it kind of introduces um, a an, an idea of what is to be used and what is to be left aside and to be eliminated. And uh, you Uh, take this example of noise in order to point out that actually, no, the way in which cybernetics looks at this question of noise is actually problematic because it eliminates aspects of the existing world, so to speak, or the, the surroundings that we live in. It eliminates aspects of these surroundings that are actually very much useful and fruitful and should be taken into account uh, when it comes to the way that we approach in this case, anarchist cybernetics. And um, for this, you look at different um, ways that noise can be framed and you develop an idea of a form of noise that actually should be part of the way that we approach anarchist cybernetics. And this is called pink noise. So could you maybe elaborate what what we have to uh, imagine if we think about pink noise? 
Yes, this is actually based on some work that um, some people who are involved in the Indignados movement in Spain um, developed. So they kind of, and this was looking at the um, sort of social media activity um, that, that was related to that, to that movement. And what they were able to do was, you know, suggest in very broad terms that there's um, essentially three different types of noise in, 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 in these in these kind of social media communication systems. So, you know, if you imagine in terms of what I've just said about, you know, communication and information, you know, social media is one of the ways that we share information. But if we were to go on, you know, Facebook or Twitter, um, it's impossible for us to see and grasp everything that everyone that, that everybody is sharing, right? There's just there's just far too much, far too high quantity of information there. Even just, you know, if we've got Facebook with our you know, close friends, there's still a huge amount that people could could be sharing there. And it's very difficult for us to actually see and process all of that in a in a kind of effective way. And so what, what these um, sort of data scientists and activists were able to do was look at the sort of, and I think it was just focused on Twitter, um, that that kind of, you know, sort of social media information um, ecosystem in, in a sense, and see well. There's there's different outcomes from the information being shared, um, and that very much depends on the way that noise is is handled within with within these systems. So you see, there's the sort of two extremes here. There's the kind of um, white noise, which is just incredibly chaotic. So there's no real. So the person looking at information isn't really able to see any kind of pattern at all. It's just it just looks like random sort of snapshots of information. You know, if you if you imagine this as different tweets, there's maybe you're not really able to see. Okay, I can't really see an actual an actual thread emerging here. I can't see an actual narrative emerging from from this. It's just, it looks like it's just thousands of people spewing out lots of different you know opinions and thoughts and experiences and everything, and and I can't. I don't have an overall picture of this is what's actually happening within this this kind of social movement. Um, and they say, well, that that kind of very chaotic white noise, that doesn't really allow you to organise in any kind of effective way, right? The kind of organisation that goes along with that is going to be very sporadic, very, very spontaneous, very chaotic, not, not coordinated in any kind of way. So it's not really any kind of actual self-organisation. It's just lots of people responding and reacting and running about chaotically. At the other extreme of that, they say, well, you, you, you can have a communication system where things are highly regulated and highly organized. So you maybe have some kind of, you know, wh wh whether it's actually a sort of central, central control agency that's deciding to filter the information in a very, very specific way so that you only see a very very narrow subset of the information, um, it, you know that might be I don't know if if the communication ecosystem was controlled by a political party or something. They might say, well, you know, we we we've got our you know goals as a political party, and we're only going to give you information that we think is going to be beneficial to that. So that that creates a form of organisation, but it creates an incredibly rigid form of organisation where. If everyone's only seeing one narrative from the information, then that only gives them the resources to act in a very, very narrow range of ways. So they can only really act in very specific ways, which for you know something like a political party is quite useful because they kind of want people to be doing very specific actions. They don't want people to be um, you know, doing their own thing in different ways. They want people to be very, very, very coordinated, like highly coordinated and controlled. If you imagine a political party during an election cycle, they want people to be putting out the same message because that's that's what had, the party needs to be happening at that moment. They need everyone to be on message. They need everyone to be um, responsible in, in very specific ways. But then from a cybernetics perspective, that kind of very rigid organisation, you know, everything we kind of discussed so so far today, um, that that's not a very effective mode of organisation. It might be able to hold together for a very short period of time, but ultimately it's too rigid to be able to respond to any kind of change effectively. So ultimately, it's going to, you know, either 
maintain itself through you know, very direct control of the people involved, or it's going to break down because it can't respond to a changing environment. And so a very sort of narrow control of information, these people sort of suggest, um, you know, produces or is more beneficial to that very, very rigid form of organisation. So you have these two extremes, the white noise, which is very chaotic, very sporadic, no sort of coherent narrative. And if people have that information, that's going to lead to very spontaneous, very chaotic action. It's not coordinated action. On the other extreme, you have you know, very, very controlled, very rigid narrative in terms of information. Um, and that, that's the kind of brown noise. Um, so very kind of solid, you know, coherent noise. Um, but it's one narrative, it's one you know, sort of channel of control in a sense. Um, and that either you know, produces or reinforces or is beneficial for very rigid, very top-down, very controlled forms of organisation. In between these, you have something called pink noise. Um, and that's where you have a sort of balance between these two. It's not you know, dominated by one specific narrative. So the information isn't filtered. So there's only one narrative coming through. But it's not as chaotic as the white noise. So what you have in the information is you might have a series of narratives that are a bit more autonomous and a bit more self-generating but there is a sort of coherent set of narratives. So you as a person looking at this information can see, okay, I can see what's happening here. Um, it's not so chaotic that I don't have any idea, but I'm also not only getting one narrative. I'm seeing different things and I'm able to, through seeing these different things, understand what's happening. I can actually use this information effectively. And so these people who are involved in the Indignados process sort of say, well, that kind of noise in a system we have some kind of coordination, but it's but it's not not super rigid. That you know produces or reinforces um, the kind of self organization that we've been talking about today, because people are able to see from the information. Okay, I can see that this is useful. This narrative is useful. We can use that, or that's relevant to us. We can draw on that, and that allows us to organize. Um, and I think that's really important because it's. I mean, it's, it's, it's very, very speculative and it's very vague. It's not, you know, prescribing a specific way that information channels can be organised or that systems should be designed. It's very, very vague, but it is saying that there is a relationship between how information is organised and filtered and how that information can be practically used or, or or developed on or built on so if we have information that's in the form of like with a kind of pink noise where there's some sort of differentiation there's some variety some sort of diversity in, in the information but we can still pick out coherent you know narratives or coherent um sort of stories coming through from the information then we can act on it in constructive ways we have the resources from that information to be able to self-organize while you're talking, I'm kind of trying to uh, figure out whether or not people might actually be able to to understand what what you're talking about. Because if I'm not mistaken, the the way in which you use the term information is already a very specific one. You have a high degree of information if the signal is actually not that clear <laughs> if there's if there's a lot going on beyond the actual content of the um of the of the signal so to speak so that's that's high information and this uh, is something that you now and uh, based on the um on these researchers uh, try to inspect a bit more closely and try to take a look at whether or not there might be something useful in it and actually stating yes there might be if it's not too chaotic or too stable but presents itself in a way that is already again, maybe format it or presents itself in a way that strikes a balance between the two, then it it should be incorporated into um, the organization of the structure additional to what would be 
termed in the classical information theory, the signal. So that, I think this is something we need to kind of point out uh, towards the audience because it already operates on a level where this idea of information theory and what is signal and what is noise and what would should be um, rejected and whatnot is, is taken for granted. And I believe <laughs> that most of the people are not familiar with that. But maybe you could uh, um, correct me if I'm wrong. Is, 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 did I get that right? Yeah, it's 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 incredibly incredibly difficult. I think, and, I, and it's something I don't. I'm not hundred percent convinced. I've got my head around because it is. You know, when we, when we think of information, we think about the 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 content that's communicated, right? So if I give you information, I'm telling you something, and there's a certain content there. And in some of this sort of early, early information theory, that wasn't what they were talking about, um, and that makes it really really difficult to work out when some of these authors and people like Stafford Beer, who are to some degree building on their work, are talking about information, um, it's difficult to often say, okay, exact, what exactly are they talking about here? Um, I think the sort of most useful way of thinking about it is thinking about what this means in practice for us and, 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 and what noise means in practice. So as you said, you know, noise in a system is, in a communication system is, normally the thing that we want to eliminate so if you imagine you know that it doesn't happen now but you know in in the past when you turn the tv on there, there might be a certain amount of static that sort of fuzzy you know white staticky noise and and and, and the image that went with it um and you would try and you know go, go, going back quite a while you know you, you you would try and adjust your tv aerial so that the picture comes through and you don't have that static fuzzy noise. Um, so you're trying to eliminate the noise. You're trying to say, well, can we, we want the signal and we don't want the noise. And obviously that, that's great for TV, right? Because, because you know, we need that because we, we wanted to see, see the signal. We wanted to watch, watch the TV program at that moment um, or on you know, radio, it still, still, still works um, in exactly the same way. But I think what a sort of more sort of critical look at noise and information allows us to do is say there's always a kind of built-in logic to doing that so it's fine if it's if we're trying to find a particular tv station or a particular radio station and we want that specifically and we know what it is we want we can filter out the noise we can adjust the dial or the aerial and we'll get the signal that we know we want but often in terms of communication information, that's not, not the case. We don't know what it is we're looking for. We're trying to learn something new. Someone trying to tell us something that we don't know what it is already. So when it's actually people sharing information, we need to be much more careful about what we're eliminating. So if we're thinking about social media, okay, the noise doesn't look like, you know, white, fuzzy, static. The noise instead looks like, well, I've got a timeline of tweets that I'm scrolling through. And I can't work out what's what's important, what I need to focus on, what I need to put my attention on, and what is um, just kind of, you know, useless advertising or stuff that doesn't interest me. And it's, it's very difficult to tell. So when we're scrolling through, it's very difficult for us to work out, this is something I need to be looking at. And this is something that... Um, is, has no relevance to me, isn't, isn't, isn't relevant to what I'm, what I'm interested in or what I'm wanting to do, do in the world. And I think what, so one, one thing we have to be careful of with noise in is thinking about, okay, are we filtering out things that just don't make sense to us, but which could actually be really important for us, you know? So we have to kind of be aware of like, you know, we don't want to end up in the echo chamber where we're filtering out things that, oh, well, that, I, I don't really agree with that but I'll filter it out and then I'm actually missing a huge part of the picture of what's happening in the world. But the other really big danger is that how things like you know, Facebook and Twitter and other sort of similar platforms operate is they're already filtering out a lot of what they think of as noise. And that's incredibly political. So I think anyone who scrolls through their Facebook feed now will see okay, there's a lot of adverts, right? There's much more than there was 10 years ago. Now it's like, you know, every two or three items on a news feed is a, a sponsored advert for something. And we haven't always decided that we want to see that, right? The, 
algorithm that Facebook has and the fact that there are companies who pay money for that advertising, that's what decides what filters through the noise, right? So things that we might find really important um, are filtered out by these by these you know, corporations essentially, um, in order for us to see what they think is important, you know, what they want us to see. The, the the advertising, for example, and a lot of um, political content is being filtered out in this way. So a lot of stuff that is very relevant to the political and economic situation we find ourselves in, and to learning about that and and to trying to change that is being filtered out by these systems in favour of sponsored adverts, you know, spam, celebrity gossip, things like this. So I think thinking about that sort of information and noise stuff, I think it's, it's, it's yeah, the, the technical side is really interesting because it's fun to try and get our heads around how people were using these terms and what they were meaning and why that was important for what came afterwards. But really the interesting thing is, well, what does this mean in practice? And if we're talking about how do we filter noise in a communication system, given that for us, the main communication system now is social media, still, um, the fact that there's you know, corporations like Facebook and Twitter, and then all the companies that are paying to advertise, that's that sort of corporate process is what's doing the filtering. It's not something we have any control over at all. So we, we, we might need to have some filtering, so it might just be too much. You know, we, we, we can only look at a certain amount of stuff and actually process it mentally. So we need to do some kind of filtering, that's, that's fine. But it needs to be something we have control over. So there needs to be some kind of, an, and again, this is incredibly speculative, but there needs to be some kind of way that the algorithms that are doing the filtering are somehow subject to some kind of democratic control. So that even though we know what we're getting is filtered, um, the noise that's filtered out is something we've at least agreed to. We've at least said, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm ha- I've, I've had some democratic say in how the algorithm operates. I know why it works. It works in a way that that, that we think is, you know, politically and ethically um, beneficial. So that the, the filtering is fine. It's like 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 an uh, email spam folder, which actually filters out the spam. You know, it's like that. That's fantastic, right? Because it allows us to only see the emails that are important. So we need to have something like that, I think, for these for these kind of social media platforms. Absolutely, we do. So the uh, decision over what is seen as noise and what is not is absolutely political. I would definitely uh, agree, and maybe. But this would lead us in a, into a different terrain. Um, I, maybe I would add that even before that, one would have to think about the things that are not information and not communication and provide ways in which they can be included in the processes that we uh, use as organizational processes as well. Because um, if you only consider communication and information this is already a form of filtering as well i would say um, but this is a, a different um, topic i would say um, in order to to enable the kinds of communication anarchist cybernetics uh, relies on you you stress the need and this was implicit in your answer right now already you, you stress the need for alternative social media platforms so maybe you could give us a, a sketch what could they look like and what are the functional elements that they should provide so i think the the question of what kind of communication systems are you know, sort of functionally useful for, for the kind of self-organization we've been talking about. It's both really, really important, but also incredibly difficult to, to start to do, I think. Um, so when I started looking at this topic, and this was, you know, as I said, like 2011, around you know, the Occupy movement and things, and at that point still, there was a lot of hope in social media. So there was still, still at that point, I mean, it was, there was a lot of criticism of it, but it was still a sort of idea that you know, things like Facebook and Twitter can be productive for a kind of radical politics. 
Um, I don't think anyone believes that now. I think now we're we're really in a in the sort of um, dystopian nightmare scenario of how these platforms have developed and the kind of the the, the ways they produce, you know, mental health crises and and conflict and you know um, political um, kind of outcomes is is much more. Yeah, it's, it's it's much bleaker now than it was than it was um ten years ago. Although I think a lot of that was probably even on the horizon then. So I think it's it's quite difficult to sort of imagine. Okay, how what kind of platforms would be better than them? What kind of platforms would work that would fulfil some of the same functions, um, but do so in a way that is much more conducive to 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 kind of radical anarchist politics and the kind of self-organization that's involved in an anarchist cybernetics. Um, I think I always have to preface these kind of discussions with saying that I'm not uh you know platform developer, I'm not an app designer, I don't know anything about you know computer coding or design or anything like that. So it's my sort of perspective on it is very much for the kind of um political and organizational functions that these these kind of communication systems would would need to have um i think there's there's a lot of different ones in terms of thinking about well what does self organization look like in practice for for you know kind of an- anarchist collectives and social movements and you know also at a larger scale of things like you know sort of participatory and democratic um constitution making what do those things look like? And then how could a platform help facilitate some of that? Because I think that's the really, and that, that's something that comes through in Stafford Beer's work a lot. So when he was he was writing, you know, as far back as the 1950s when computers were still in their infancy. But even then he was clear in saying, well, the, the way computing is developing is it's it's um not developing in the direction whereby it's going to be helping us, you know, do the sort of basic functions of a human society. It's um, helping us make, you know, work more efficient maybe, or helping us do, to pr- produce more and, 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 and do more in terms of our, our, our working lives, but it's not necessarily actually helping us, you know, communicate as a society or share ideas or share knowledge or things like that. So I think, that's the important thing is what start what sort of perspective or starting point are, are are we coming from with thinking about technology and it has to be how does it help us do things like self-organization that said it's still incredibly difficult to work out exactly what that would look like and i think the reason for that is there's quite a strong disconnect between platforms that have been developed that are you know very very successful at the sort of more sort of practical or functional side of self-organization so we have things like uh, lumio for example which is you know it's, it's 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 developed by workers cooperative it's designed specifically to help you know cooperatives and sort of movements and, and communities that are organized in cooperative and democratic ways to help them function. Um, and it does that very well in terms of the sort of technical and functional aspects. It's a you know, fantastic platform. But what it doesn't have is the kind of social aspect that something like Facebook or Twitter still has. Um, so there's, there's, a, there's a reason that a lot of the alternative um, sort of you know, social media platforms or things that have branded themselves as alternative social media platforms that have been focused on activists in some way or focused on you know, kind of activist organizing. I think there's a reason that not many of them have actually been successful because they haven't effectively mirrored this sort of social dynamic. So one of the things that um, I think is incredibly important and also one of the sort of dangers of something like Facebook or, or Twitter um, I'm, I'm, yeah, I, I, feel, I feel like I'm, I'm already very sort of old school with this, talking just about Facebook and Twitter, because I know there's like, a, you know, a host of new platforms like Twitch and stuff that that, that, that people are using in TikTok. 
that's just sort of outside of my sort of wheelhouse now. I think I think I'm I'm, I'm feeling very old when I talk about social media now, even which didn't feel that way ten years ago. But yeah, if we look at some you know, these sorts of platforms, the reason they're successful is um, people socialize on them, right? People spend time with their friends on them. People make friends on these platforms. Um, they're not just communicating in very functional ways. They're something that we think is incredibly important is people are wasting time on these platforms, which is what you do with friends, right? When you get together with your friends, you don't say, right, we're, we're going to organize something here. We're going to do some, some detailed, you know, very efficient organizing. You might do that, but most of the time when you get together with your friends, you're having stupid conversations, you're telling stupid jokes, you're just not really doing anything, just wasting time together. I think that's actually incredibly important for for how how we build relationships is like, you know, you're you're getting together to not really do anything, to just sort of be together. And I think things like Facebook and Twitter work great for that. And they exploit that, right? Because they you then become addicted to it and you get drawn in and they they channel that activity in very specific ways. But that's the real challenge, I think, for some kind of alternative platform is like. It, it can do all the functional stuff for self-organization very, very well, but it's still not the kind of place that people want to actually hang out and spend time. Um, or it's much more difficult to use those platforms in that way. Um, and I think that's the big challenge is, well, A, how do we sort of mirror some of that to get people you know, away from these sort of mainstream corporate platforms that are, you know, channeling information in specific ways and, and producing behavior in very specific ways. How do we get them away from that, but still keep that social aspect? Because people aren't going to just give up because, I mean, I think people who, people who give up on social media are, you know, fantastic. I think these are brilliant people and they should be lauded for their ability to do that. But for most of us, that would mean no longer having contact with a huge number of our friends because, I mean, I've, I've I've got friends all around the world, and if if I wasn't seeing them, seeing them post, you know, memes and and jokes on Facebook, I'd I'd probably never have contact with these people anymore. And I think that that that'd be really sad. So like, it is like, how do we mirror the sort of social aspect? How do we make these platforms things that people want to spend time on, but also that people don't become addicted to that people you know, are able to say, okay, I can do this online and it's fun and it gets me some great contact, I have some great friendships, I can build relationships, but I'm still doing stuff outside of that. That's not my entire life because that in itself is very, very damaging. That's sort of being, being solely locked in on a kind of um, digital platform or that sort of mode of communication. So I think that's that's the real challenge in terms of less about the sort of specifics of the architecture now and more about how do we have something that fulfills that social function and that does that in a way that doesn't exploit us or doesn't doesn't um, take advantage of the fact that we need that social contact. And when it comes to the coordination part of things, um, I mean, this would be an interesting aspect as well of a potential platform. And you are right now very much focusing on um, like a functional equivalent to classical social media, so to speak. But I mean, it would be very interesting to provide platforms that are able to facilitate these processes that are actually important for anarchist cybernetics in terms of coordination, in terms of decision making, for example, helping with these questions of questions of grant strategy, with coordinating different activities on different levels, all of the stuff that that will be an essential part of uh, effective uh, so self-organization, so to speak. And um, I think this would be an area where alternative platforms will be of help and need, need to be of help as well if we consider the question of scalability that we talked about before. Yeah, d definitely. Um, and I think that's where we have seen the most, the most sort of promise in terms of alternatives. Um, I mean, I think that the, the difficulty is that although a lot of this sort of development work um, you know, developing web platforms, it feels very 
you know, accessible and very democratic because all you need is a computer and you just need the time to do it and to, you know, to learn, learn some of the coding and things. Um, actually, the platforms that, that work well and that are effective and successful cost a huge amount of money to develop. So even something like Lumio, which is probably the most successful in terms of something that's designed specifically to support, you know, cooperative type ways of, of organizing. I mean, it was still relatively small budget compared to, you know, a big social media platform, but it was still quite a lot of money and time went into it. Um, so it's, there's still that big barrier to, um, I think, fully experimenting with different platforms. Um, so even though it feels like, well, we can just try different things out, that th- th- there's there's a, a lot of barriers to actually doing that. But I think that's where there's the most sort of promise, as I said. I think it is... Um, I mean, L- Lumio is is the is the success story here um, because it is it, the functionality is fantastic. It, it works really really well. It, what I think is really important is it, it integrates with other platforms, which is really important because I think there's um, I think the way so the way the way I sort of characterize it in the book is a bit too much focusing on can we create one platform that can do everything, um, and I think that the sort of Reality now is, well, can we actually have a handful of platforms that integrate together? So you're not having to have, for example, you know, Lumio, which is, is essentially a kind of forum type sort of format where you have different threads within a forum and different subgroups. Um, you know, people can be members of different groups, which is really important. It also allows for decision making. So it has different models of decision making built into it. So people can make proposals w- w- within a thread. And you know they, they they can be subject to you know, consensus or majority or whatever, but there's different democratic mechanisms within within Lumio for actually making decisions as well as just having discussions. But you know if we were thinking about well how can that be the sort of complete package, we would say well, you know given so much of the work that we're doing now is is online or or distance or working from home, does Lumio then need to have a kind of video conferencing? functionality built in i think that's where it would get incredibly difficult to develop a single platform that actually has all of that functionality because it would it maybe be a very 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 you know server intensive platform which would cost a lot to run cost a lot to develop so is it better to think okay we can have you know other platforms so like um jitsi for example which is you know kind of you know open source um, video conferencing platform. Um, you have things like Framapad, which is a kind of, you know, again, open source version of kind of um, Google Docs, you know, something like that. Can we just integrate these platforms together better so that we're not having to constantly be going, okay, well, we'll use this platform for this and this one for this. And then we've got really important information in two different places. Can we just have these integrated somehow rather than being the one platform? But how do we just create that kind of um, synchronization so that we can maybe work prim- primarily within Lumio, but then go to a different platform for the video conferencing, but we're still accessing it through Lumio somehow without having to completely go out of that, that ecosystem. So I think that's that's um, where is the most sort of sort of practical potential is sort of how, how do we network between between different platforms um, to provide all these functions. So things like, you know, ha- having discussions that are, you know, productive and effective and moderated in, in, in fair ways um, that everyone has a chance to speak, but that we can also make effective democratic decisions that everyone feels they've had a genuine chance to take part in where we can you know, store documents of our agreements that we've made that we can quickly see, okay, this is who agreed to what. These are the agreements that we made as a group. We can quickly check back on things where we can, where we can, um, you know, one of the core functions of the viable system model is being able to, to monitor what's happening in the organization. How do we build that into, you know, so is that already in Lumio? Do we, do we have that functionality there? Do we need to maybe Build on that. We need to bring something else in that can, where we can have that monitoring and be able to easily see it, where it's transparent and people don't feel that it's that they're just being monitored by a by a kind of um, algorithm or something. 
So I think that's those are the kind of difficult questions at the, at the moment. Yeah, and I would definitely agree that it needs to be a combination of different approaches. So I think in, in some situations there might be a already existing alternative like Jitsi. I think this is a very good example. Okay, we do not need to invent another open source video conferencing uh, platform, but it would make sense to integrate it in in the platform that uh, tries to provide it all as a use, user experience, because this, I think, is pretty much important that it would be very helpful if we had one platform that is able to provide these different services in an open source kind of way plus x plus additional services that do not yet exist in an open source fashion so i'm not sure if we did this already sufficiently it's difficult to say actually we had this example of the movement of the squares you also gave an example when it comes to a cooperatively run cafe um, but still i think there is a layer a level when it comes to anarchist cybernetics that we kind of touched upon but did not yet spell out in full i mean this <laughs> probably will not be possible but still i would be interested if um if we take a look at the level of society as a whole where could we go from here if we if we consider the these insights of cybernetic uh, of anarchist cybernetics and if we try to extrapolate these insights into a future that that is um, also on a society-wide level organized along these principles of anarchist cybernetics so how would that look like and how how would a process that that tries to make uh, use of these insight look like how how could this uh, brought into existence in order to get to a point at which to quote Allende, at last the people are in control so I think one of the most interesting sort of examples along these lines is the mutual aid networks that that grew up during during the COVID pandemic. So obviously these these were you know d depending on on, on where, where these happened and who was involved they were you know more or less radical in different ways. Um, but this was a you know moment which I think anyone. Um, you know, obviously, no one anticipated that. That, that well, some people did anticipate the pandemic, and they weren't listened to. But you know, like no, nobody really expected it to happen. But also, I think no anarchists expected the sort of term mutual aid, which is you know something that comes from Peter Kropotkin's work, which is a really, really strong part of the anarchist anarchist tradition. For that word to suddenly have this, you know, massive, massive global currency and and loads of people using it, and you know, thousands upon thousands of groups around the world, um, using using this term, so that was really, really interesting that that sort of happened and no one really expected it. But it is the kind of thing. I mean, that as I've sort of said said earlier, you know, when you know these these anarchists like Kropotkin were you know, d describing the kind of societies that they wanted to build, they they weren't just imagining these. They were saying, well, this is how things have worked in the past, or we can see examples of it already happening. We should do more of this. And, and mutual aid is one of those examples. So, you know, Kropotkin says, well, mutual aid's happening all the time. We're constantly helping each other um, in, in a kind of mutual way without the need for, um, you know, payment, without the need for sort of in, any kind of direct, direct um, compensation. We just help each other collectively that's a normal thing that you know humans do other animal species do plants do so i think how those mutual aid groups developed is really really important because these were by and large very autonomously organized so there wasn't i mean one of the failures of government was that there wasn't any kind of coordination for those first few weeks of 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 lockdowns in in, in a lot of countries Definitely in, the, definitely in the UK, there wasn't any central coordination. Um, it took a long time for government to actually think about how they need to be supporting people during something like uh, you know, lockdown. And so these mutual aid groups emerged you know, semi-spontaneously, a lot of the time with people who already had experience or already had worked together in similar things to try and make sure people's basic needs were provided for. So ensure people had food if they weren't able to leave the, leave the house, um, ensure that people had social contact, 
you know, guaranteeing that people people could get medication that they needed if they weren't able to go to the pharmacy. Um, so a lot of these kind of you know b- basic functions were being provided by um, groups of volunteers. You know, people getting together without any central coordination, quite autonomously. You know, often making decisions in very democratic ways. You know, networking horizontally with other groups nearby. So it was really interesting to see how this happened, and I think that's the kind of thing that is the most concrete of thinking about what what could this, you know, anarchist cybernetic stuff, what could this look like um, at, at, at a kind of larger scale in the most immediate term. And I think it's building on those kind of mutual aid networks. Now, a lot of them um, you know, ended up, you know, falling apart when they were lo- no longer directly needed a lot of the time governments came in and started to take on coordinating roles. Um, and a lot of people in the sort of NGOs and charities started to sort of take more leadership type coordinating positions. So, so the, the mutual aid groups often weren't radical to begin with, but it was definitely a sort of process of de-radicalization, moving away from something that could be seen as this is potentially an alternative way we can start organizing society, start looking out for each other collectively. Definitely moved away from that, but there's still that sort of germ there of, well, we we, we did that, you know, two two years ago at the start of these lockdowns. So there clearly is that potential in in societies to um to build these kind of autonomous self-help communities. And cybernetics is I, th- I think really essential to working out how they can be at their most effective. So the kind of things I was describing with the viable systems model and um, you know, John, John Walker's work in particular for thinking about how how a you know something like a cooperative or like a you know anarchist type collective could use the viable systems model to help them um, design their own processes and design their ways of organizing and ways of working. You know, mutual aid groups could be doing that kind of thing so that they can actually be more conscious and more aware of this is how we are at our most effective. This is how we need to be organizing to, to be doing what we want to do, to be you know, providing the kind of um, support that, that, that we want to be providing for each other. And I think that has the potential to say, okay, well, we, we can do it in this you know, small aspect of our lives. Can we just start organizing public services in this way you know can we start you know we, we we managed during covid to ensure that everyone had access to medication well can we maybe just organize you know that's that kind of logistics network for distributing essentials like medication can we organize that in a you know, democratic and non-hierarchical way you know we we did it during covid maybe we can do that more generally so maybe those mutual aid networks give us the sort of framework to start thinking about this is how we could be reorganizing society in different ways again the question is how much of that well i mean it it remains to be seen what the legacy of those mutual aid networks is going to be because it's still still very fresh and we're still in the very unusual circumstances of coming out of the, the the pandemic or potentially still going into um, just just the, the next phase of the pandemic. Um, but I think that's potentially in the long term. You know, what's the legacy of the mutual aid? Can that be something we build on to think about how we coordinate the, the, the various functions of the, the lives that we have together? And there's a last question that I ask all of my guests, and that is, if you think about the future, what makes you joyful? I think that's a fantastic question, and it's one that I'm I'm, I'm going to be very, very bleak on and say nothing. <laughs> um, I think, uh, yeah, I, it's it's hard to. I think at the moment we're in, it's hard to see much hope. So even though I was talking about mutual aid and there's potentially, you know, the possibility of expanding that to how we reimagine society and reimagine the way we live and work together having the hope that that's going to happen is a very different question, I think. Um, I mean, just the situation we're in as we're recording this, you know, where the UK is facing 40 degree temperatures for the first time 
there's you know big parts of the world that have having up up up, up to 50 degree temperatures that have never had that before really it's it's just it's just terrifying how bleak the future is um and whether there's the potential of stopping that kind of you know dramatic and catastrophic climate change or whether we're at the stage now of we need to try and minimize it maybe and somehow come through the other side in some way as a as a effective working societies and um, whether that'll happen i'm really not sure and not not very hopeful sadly and also you know what we we're talking about in terms of the digital platforms and technologies i mean the temperatures that we're seeing around the world now you know electrical circuits start melting technology stops working so it's is is this slightly a kind of fantasy we're indulging in um yeah, I apologise. That's an incredibly bleak note to end on, but it's yeah, it's 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 where where I sort of feel in the moment. I think sadly, no need to apologise. Uh, everybody can answer whatever he, she, or they might with this question. So this is absolutely super interesting to me to hear as well. And I have to add, you're not the first one to not being positive <laughs> about this uh, uh, question. So. And this is absolutely a valid answer as well. Yeah, I think, I think, I mean, one, one thing that is, I think, a, a sort of change in my lifetime that seems to be just going in the right direction, I think, is um, if, if I see how, how much more adept people are now at you know, thinking through things like gender and sexuality, uh, you know, that's, that's, I mean, that's just incredible. If, if I think back to, experiences that I saw when I was in school and how you know homophobic it was and and then hearing from friends or teachers knowing about how young people nowadays are are dealing with things like gender and sexuality I mean that that that's that gives me a lot of hope that's incredibly encouraging to just see those those like dramatic dramatic advances in in such such a short space of time um so that's, that's one thing to be, to be hopeful about, perhaps. Yeah. Nice. Thomas, thank you so much for being part of Future Histories. Yeah, th thank you so much for inviting me on. I've really, really enjoyed this. And, and thanks for taking the time to read the book and yeah, come up with such, such interesting questions. I really, really enjoyed discussing it. And I really, really appreciate the, 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 the time that you've putting in, put into to going through the book and, and giving it so much consideration. Well, I'm happy to. As I said before, I immensely enjoyed reading the book. So thank you too. Thank you so much. That was our show for today. Thanks a lot for listening. If you want to support Future Histories, you can do so on Patreon. For this, visit patreon.com slash futurehistories or you can simply tell a friend that you liked the show and that he, she or they might like it as well. Thanks a lot and hear you in two weeks.